Hi, I'm Andrew Torres, and this is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Step aside. Welcome back to the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. We've been away for some time, but as promised, it is Star Wars Day, May the 4th, 2017. This is your host, Bryce Blankenagle, returning from a month and a half long hiatus. Thank you all for joining me and welcome. All right. It is... How should I say it? It's challenging trying to figure out how to start this episode. There's so much bouncing around my head at the moment, and it's it's a legitimate challenge to decide where to start here. Now, I want to recount some of the Mormon History Tour as well as Reason Con, which are both fresh on my mind at the moment, but this is also our return episode, and I can't spend the entire hour plus talking about what happened recently without a little dive into what's happening in our historical timeline. As per the regular formula of the Historical Timeline episodes, we'll get into a roundup of the last historical episode in our timeline for the milk of the episode, and then we'll move into the meat for a segment talking about Liberty Jail, where our heroes currently reside. After that, we'll take a bit of a longer final segment to discuss some of the Mormon history tour as well as Reason Con And a bunch of business to take care of before we button up this return from hiatus episode and we get back to our regular weekly schedule. On to the milk. The last historical episode was a big one. Mostly because we spent so much time reading through just witness testimonies of the November 1838 Court of Inquiry. And, you know, we eventually kind of came to an understanding of what happened with the sham legal proceedings endured by the Saints after the Mormon-Missouri War was officially declared a victory for the Missourians, which followed the surrender of the Mormons at Far West and Diamond in their twin sanctuary cities. Now, we took a vantage point perspective of what happened. You know, we heard multiple firsthand accounts of similar situations from people involved in the proceedings of all of 1838 in Missouri. We heard from some of the Missouri militia and from many more Mormons who gave us insight as to what really went down on the Mormon side in Missouri during the conflict. And we can unequivocally say that Joe was doing some brashly illegal activities and Those activities were carried out at the hands of his trusted followers, who otherwise may not have committed any illegal actions. Joe was a mob boss, ordering around his little cronies to carry out the will of the Lord for whatever Joe interpreted that to be. Unfortunately, it wasn't so simple for the court of inquiry. They weren't staring at an open and shut military case. You know, Joe and the leadership should have been tried in a civil court, but since they were acting as a private military, not with state sanctioned status, of course, they went through the court of inquiry instead, which was a legal proceeding reserved for military infractions. Joe and friends were civilians. This court of inquiry was the wrong tool, and it was even wielded incorrectly in prosecuting Joe and company. Now, in listening back to episode 50, I had this realization that I didn't actually read the charges leveled by Justice King. Austin A. King was his name. Now, I read the initial charges of the 53 defendants who were being charged, but we went through the entire episode and I just finished with reading testimonials and a wrap-up. 
Instead of reading the active charge documents individually, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to read a quick paragraph from The Rise of Mormonism by H. Michael Marquardt. This is from page 488, and he sums up things better than I ever could. Quote, After Judge Austin A. King heard the testimony of the witnesses, he discharged 29 of the defendants because of the lack of sufficient evidence. 24 Mormon prisoners were considered guilty of arson, burglary, robbery, and larceny in Davies County, and as the offenses were bailable, they could post bail until the next term of the Davies County Circuit Court. But the court believed that Joseph Smith and four other Mormons were guilty of overt acts of treason in Davies County. Smith, together with Lyman White, Hiram Smith, Alexander McRae, and Caleb Baldwin were to answer the charge in March of 1839. Sidney Rigdon was charged with treason committed in Caldwell County. They were committed to Liberty Jail in Clay County. Since the death of Moses Rowland occurred in Ray County, it was believed that Parley P. Pratt, Norman Shearer, Darwin Chase, Lumen Gibbs, and Morris Phelps were guilty and they were to be held in the Ray County Jail. End quote. And that's pretty much where we left off our last historical timeline on episode 50. We read the Court of Inquiry witness statements and learned that Joe, Rigdon, Hiram, and a small number of other important Mormon leaders were incarcerated in the county jail in Ray and the local jail in Liberty Clay counties. And that pretty much sums up the milk for this episode and gets us caught up in our historical timeline. So let's get into the meat and talk about the actual timeline during Joe and company's incarceration in Liberty Jail. Liberty Jail is often touted as an important milestone in church history, separating the New York and Kirtland years from the Nauvoo and Utah years. It seemingly provides incontrovertible evidence for the case that Joseph Smith was persecuted due to his religion and claims of prophethood. Unfortunately, those versions of Mormon church history during 1838 in Missouri are fairly misguided, and they're one-sided in their reporting. The claim that Joe was in jail because of religious persecution alone ignores everything the Mormons did in Missouri for all of 1838 and the seven years prior, and passes completely over what raised public ire against them in the first place. And we've been covering this time in Mormon history for like nine historical episodes by this point. Contextualizing the conflict doesn't bear repeating any more than it's been multiply reiterated by this point. That being said, thanks to this cross-country Mormon history tour from which I just returned home, I can try and offer a little bit of a first-person perspective of what the Liberty Jail is like. So, if you don't mind, um, please allow me some license to kind of paint a mental picture here. Now, Liberty is the quintessential small-town America, dinky little, you know, no-stop signs, no-stoplight town. But there is this surprisingly large building near the center of the town, and it looks like a bank or something. Now, outside of the building is a large granite or marble or some odd kind of marquee that says Liberty Jail Visitor Center of the LDS Church. And upon entering, you come into like a fairly small lobby area with a number of missionaries on staff to lead the tours of the museum. Now, on your left, when you walk in, there's a greeting desk on the, the left side of the lobby. And on the right side, there's a glass divider with doors sanctioning one half of this, this fairly large room as a small lecture area with a bunch of church chairs set up in rows to accommodate, you know, maybe, maybe like 30 people or so. And the first thing that you hear when your foot makes contact with the welcome mat is a cheery greeting from some young sister missionaries holding their books of Mormon with, you know, color-coded bookmarks. No doubt the same set of scriptures they were given by their grandparents on their eighth birthdays. In addition to the cheery greetings, you're met with bright and wholesome smiles from the young women and the elderly missionaries who are greeting you. Now, some quick conversation is typically exchanged, and they ask where you're visiting from, and eventually they offer a tour of the jail. Now, you begin the, the tour with a, like a brief lecture about the church's history in Missouri from 1830 to 1838. Luckily for me, there was a, a tour group that had began before I got there, so they decided to put me in my own tour group, and this one elder missionary 
possibly in his mid sixties or so, gave me the tour. Just me and this one missionary. It was amazing. So after the brief lecture, sitting in this room, and they have this room actually has a few exhibits posted up around the wall, including the original Liberty Jail uh, key and locking mechanism. They have uh, different placards that are uh, telling the story of the saints in Missouri. They have these exhibits all over, and you can take a second to read them and take pictures. And they also tell you essentially what was going on in Missouri and how Joseph and the other leaders ended up in Liberty Jail. So after you go through the lecture, you're ushered through this large wooden door into the vault. And what a sight to behold. The vault, it's just this massive... Um, octagonal concrete and granite safe built around a mock-up reconstruction of the jail. So Liberty Jail is literally built inside of this massive cement chamber. And the jail itself is missing one wall so you can see a cross-section of the building into the actual jail. And you get an idea for what it would have been like to be confined in there. Now, of course, when you first walk in, it's this magnificent sight. The lighting is really low, and it, it, it just kind of puts you in a certain mood. So you walk around the back of the the building while the tour guide is telling you all about the roof, the bricks, the massive wooden door that has the original locking mechanism on it, so on and so forth, describes everything to you. And then you make your way down the stairs into like this dug in floor of the vault where you sit on benches at the ground level with the jail, which is a good 10 feet below the actual ground level of the building. So the the actual Liberty Jail is recessed into the ground an extra 10 feet. And since the one wall is missing, you can see the thickness of the walls, which from the inside out begin with what look like railroad ties um, chalked together tightly. You can't get through them with two feet of brick for the outside shell of the building. And in between the railroad ties and the brick shell is a bunch of loose pack large rocks that would shift and fill in gaps if there were an attempt to escape that considered the jail unescapable. Uh, yeah, um, I think they were right. The men were kept in the lower floor of the jail, or the dungeon as it was called, which was only accessible through a small trap door in the center of the main floor. A rope dangles from the overhead door down into the center of the dungeon, and everything was done with that rope, from lifting out the chamber pot to lowering the men's abhorrent meals into the depths of this melancholy little shithole. Now, as I said, the lighting was very low. It, it, they definitely create a mood inside of the vault as the tour guide continues to tell you about the Liberty Jail experience and what the leaders went through. And inside the jail are life-size mannequin models of five of the six men who are incarcerated beginning December 1st, 1838. And of course, Joe is writing at a desk that's lit by one little candle. It's at this point... The missionary uses an actual flashlight to identify each person and their role and relationship to the church. The most noticeable detail at this time for me was the fact that no mannequin reconstruction of Sidney Rigdon resides in the jail cell. Granted, Rigdon didn't spend as much time in the jail as the other guys did, but he was still there for quite some time and should be represented instead of, well, ignored. That's neither here nor there, because after the missionary points out each person, they hit a magic button, and the real tour begins. The lights are all extinguished, and you're enshrouded in darkness inside this massive concrete vault, only to hear a booming voice come over the speakers, and it reads some of Joseph Smith's and Alexander McRae's writings about how terrible the circumstances were, including the claim that they were poisoned and fed human flesh by the guards. And you learn just how terrible it was inside Liberty Jail, but the thought also occurs that likely no other jail in the country was any better or worse than this. It just so happens that Joseph was in this jail 
and people really don't like it when their profit is forced into disgusting or inhospitable conditions. You may notice on the right wall of the jail is a small bit of fallen down rocks where Joe and the others had tried to dig themselves out to manage an escape. The attempt was thwarted by the vigilant guards. We'll get into that next episode. The disembodied narrator continues through the audio experience, and the lights, you know, brighten and dim according to what he's talking about in his narration. And they have hidden lights all over on the inside of the jail where they shine spotlights on certain parts and they make it a very, like, inclusive and uh, all encompassing experience. And of course, the whole time, no mention of Sidney Rigdon. And then the audio track was over. The only thing left for that is for the missionary leading the tour to bear their testimony that this is a true work, Joseph Smith was a true prophet, and he wouldn't have suffered through such persecution if it were all a lie, would he? Then after that, they lead you out of the vault through a different door from the one that you entered, and then you're in this final exit chamber of the visitor center. Now, in this little chamber, the walls are covered with pictures of Jesus and the prophets, the current and past prophets, and even a reproduction of the gold plates locked in a glass case that's uh, at about chest height. At this point, the missionary refers you to a stack of cards on a portable desk that are eager to be filled out with curious potential prospective Mormon investigators. And that's it. The tour is over. In my experience, and... Everybody will have a different experience when they visit, of course, but I left feeling, you know, obviously stimulated from the conversation I'd had with the missionary, but also feeling kind of bamboozled, all right? Being that I was the only person in my group, the missionary and I were able to have some interesting conversations about the history, and I even called him out on a few details surrounding the Missouri-Mormon conflict. He didn't talk anything about the Mormon depredations in Davies County, and I brought that up that, yeah, that was kind of the reason why Hans Mill Massacre happened and why they were you know, collapsed upon by the Missouri militia. And beyond that, you know, it was hard not to feel like I was cheated out of some real history in everything that we were discussing. You know, it, it was incredible to see Liberty Jail and the abysmal living accommodations Joe and friends had to deal with, but the history lesson was so utterly one-sided and lacking in substance that it simply didn't make any sense. Now, it's a good thing that I'd been studying this time in Mormon history for the past year because only then was I able to fill in some massive gaping fissures between the little pieces of information the missionary was giving me and what I actually knew. The whole Liberty Jail experience is couched as pure religious persecution, ignoring all nuance that made this a two-way conflict and an actual war between the Missourians and the Mormons. It's just called religious persecution. So, real quick, I'm going to read a couple of snippets from the history.lds.org article entitled, Within the Walls of Liberty Jail. There's a link for this in the show notes, and this is going to give you an idea for what it was like during the tour with the one-sided nature of the history and the motivated storytelling. You know, these missionaries kind of run all on the same script, and some of that script is taken from this article. Quote, on December 1st, 1838, a Latter-day Saint named Caleb Baldwin was incarcerated in the lower level of the Liberty Jail in Clay County, Missouri, on charges of crimes of high treason. His prison companions included members of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, and Sidney Rigdon, as well as Lyman White and Alexander McRae. The six detainees, nearly four-month confinement, became the final episode of an eventful and often troubled history of the Latter-day Saints in Missouri. Within the walls of Liberty Jail, Baldwin scribed some of Joseph Smith's most profound reflections in letters to the scattered and destitute Latter-day Saints, portions of which were later canonized as Doctrine and Covenants, sections 121, 2, and 123. Some of these passages have become scriptural gems, often cited in Latter-day Saint discourse over the years. While the story of Liberty Jail has been told and retold from the perspective of Joseph Smith, the experience of the other incarcerated men provides additional insight. 
Baldwin, who was the most senior of the group, struggled physically and emotionally in the dungeon level of Liberty Jail. The inspiring words that came to Joseph as he dictated his letter provided comfort and counsel to Baldwin, the 47-year-old father of 10 who longed to be with his family during his four-month confinement. Spending more than four months in the snug jail proved a daunting experience. Four-foot-thick stone walls, a six-foot ceiling, and constant harassment by guards caused Joseph and his companions to describe the structure as, quote, hell surrounded with demons. The detainees were placed in the lower-level dungeon, where temperatures dropped, light dimmed, odors reeked, and time seemed to slow. Only dirty straw couches prevented the prisoners from sleeping on the stone floor, but even those wore out after a while. As was the case in other 19th century county jails, the food sickened the prisoners. Joseph and his companions described their meals as, quote, very coarse and so filthy that we could not eat it until we were driven to it by hunger. When the prisoners finally ate their servings, the food caused them to vomit almost to death. Some of the detainees suspected the guards of poisoning their food and water or even feeding them human flesh, end quote. The next historical timeline episode will discuss the writings going in and out of Liberty Jail because Joe was essentially running the church from the jail cell. Now, it's worth briefly pointing out, they stated three times in that short excerpt that the men were incarcerated for nearly four months and postulates that it was such a terrible experience. Now, I've never spent a single night in a jail cell, let alone a 19th century American jail cell with straw for a couch. So I can't offer any perspective of what this was like. But Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years. That's 81 times the number of months these guys spent in liberty. You know, people have spent their entire lives and died in prison wrongfully in worse conditions than Joe and friends experienced. Now, this is not to disparage or minimize their experience, but it's hard to make a case that this was some major crime against humanity when more egregious sentences were happening all day, every day back then, before then, and even today, 179 years after this happened. But what isn't discussed much in that article is something that we need to discuss. You know, it's worth understanding what it was like for the remaining thousands of Mormons who'd lost their homes and been chased out of Missouri with no legal recourse. After the surrender and downfall of Far West and Adam on Diamond, the twin Mormon sanctuary cities in Missouri, the Missouri militia upheld the terms of surrender negotiated with General Lucas, including the Mormons' agreement to vacate the state of Missouri. Now, it was contended that this was an unconstitutional action, which it was, but that court proceeding was tabled until July of 1839, and by that time, nearly every Mormon had already left Missouri for Illinois, and the whole thing was eventually swept under the rug. But the Mormons in Missouri, as they were moving to Illinois, were going through hell. And because it's relevant to telling this story at hand, I'm going to share another exciting experience I had while on the Mormon history tour here. After three, um, on my part, misguided futile attempts, I finally made it into the Daughters of Zion Museum in Salt Lake City. It's just a few blocks from the state capitol building. It's an amazing museum. Just the artifacts they have in there are baffling. They're completely overwhelming. But they have an entire records department in the back where I was able to find the file that they have on my great-great-great-grandfather and grandmother. It turns out that my grandma was a doctor in Utah for the nearly 40 years that she lived there. And there's even a picture of her on the wall in the doctor's room of the museum. Now, I spent a few hours reading through my grandma's recounting of her life, and more specifically, 1838 in Missouri, as the Palmers were camped out a few miles south of Hans Mill when the massacre went down and the Mormons surrendered to the Missouri militia. 
Now, you can read through a lot of Mormon journal entries or interviews conducted for the press at this time, and they all talk about the exodus from Missouri as being a very challenging time of personal struggle, while sickness and starvation gripped nearly every camp. My grandma's experience is by no means exclusive. There are hundreds of existing accounts from this time, but her experience is fairly representative of what thousands of Mormons endured from early 1838 to late 1839. Here are just a few passages, and I'm going to include a link to her brief digitized history posted on FamilySearch.org. Now, it begins with uh, the aftermath of the Hans Mill Massacre, and then it uh, I'll read all the way down until they got into Illinois. Quote, The mob at the mill killed 18, and instead of coming down to our camp as they had intended, they became frightened lest an army of saints from far west were coming down the creek and fled over a 25-mile prairie that night. While they were away, we saw a mob armed and on horses approaching. They rode down toward us on the brow of a hill a short distance away and stopped. Another sister and myself went to them, and the captain, with drawn sword, advanced. I asked him what they intended to do with us. He said, to our surprise, his company should not harm us, but he advised us to leave the vicinity, for a mob of furious men was coming. He told us of an unguarded backwoods road from which the guard had been removed, and also of a man who could act as guide. He then requested us to promise we would not reveal what he had told us, for, if it became known, his life would be in danger. So this this really nice guy of one of the Missouri militias, my grandma walked up to him and said, What's what what are you going to do? What are you have your your troop here, your platoon, what are you going to do to us? And he said, just leave. There's a secret road you can take. You'll make it safe on that road. And there's somebody there that's going to guide you along the way. But don't tell anybody I'm telling you this because they'll kill me if I told you how to get out. She continues on. We did as advised, broke up camp and started for the woods. When we traveled about 15 miles, we stopped for several days waiting on orders from far west. While there... One of the brethren arrived with the news that the saints had agreed to leave the state. We then moved on. Our food soon gave out and we had nothing to eat. My husband, Abraham Palmer, got some corn and that was all we had for three weeks. We would parch the corn and then eat it, but the small children could not do that. We had to partly chew it ourselves, it having been parched, and then feed it to them. We lived in this way for three long weeks. Then our corn gave out, and we were without any food of any kind for two days and a half. On the night of the third day, we procured a sack of flour, and then having nothing but the flour, we lived several days on spoon cakes made by mixing flour with water and baking in dry skillets. The reason for our company living for three weeks on parched corn was not due to us having no money, for there was money in the camp. We repeatedly tried to buy provisions from the settlers as we moved along our weary way in leaving the state of Missouri in compliance with the governor's extermination order. The whole country was stirred to a fever of heat in persecuting the saints, and the people would not sell us food. For example, my husband wanted to get a horse shoed that had become so tender-footed that he could not travel further without shoes. He took him five or six miles in advance of the company to a small village. As he was not known, they shooed his horse and took him in the house for dinner. While they were eating, our company passed. The women and larger children were wailing, holding up their skirts while wading through the mud and slush, which was ankle deep in many places, as it rained and snowed nearly all of the time. This is, I mean, this is in November and December of 1838. There's not really much of a worse time to be moving from Missouri to Illinois. The woman of the house, seeing us go by, said, I wish all those women and children would take cold and die. The man said viciously, I wish I could see old Joe Smith tied to a pile of wood and I have the privilege of kindling it. I would say to the fire, burn slow. 
One might ask why my husband did not buy food under this guise as a single horseman. He did try it once and was denounced as a Mormon. During that never-to-be-forgotten journey coming out of Missouri, we traveled through mud, snow, and ice, as had been stated nearly all the way. All excepting the little children went on foot. As we had already traveled a thousand miles or more that summer to get to Missouri, our horses were almost worn out, and it was all they could do to slowly move our wagons. One day, a company of mobbers going to Far West surrounded us, calling us to halt, and the leader with drawn sword asked for the captain of our company. My husband stepped out to him. The leader said, We have orders from the governor to search your wagons and take your guns and books. Mr. Palmer told him our wagons had been searched and our guns taken from us and showed a receipt to that effect. They then rode on. And as they did, so one man placed the muzzle of his gun almost against my breast and said, I swear I'd kill a damned Mormon when I left home, and now is my chance. I looked him fearlessly in the eyes. When the captain told him to put down his gun, which he did, and then rode on. One man, a more humane one, said as he passed me, Good women, you'd better go and get into your wagon. You will catch your death wading through this water and mud. They rode to the top of the hill we had just ascended and simultaneously fired off their guns, making the air ring with demonic yells. One day I will ever remember, we travel over a prairie. It was covered with ice, slush, and snow. One step the ice would hold us up, the next would break through over our shoe tops. Thus our feet were wet all the day long. At night, we camped by a stream of water with timber and brush along its banks. We parched our corn, of which we made our supper, after which some cut down brush to sleep upon to keep their beds out of the water that was running everywhere. Some slept in wagons, which was but little better, as the covers had become worn and torn from our long traveling. Next morning, I awoke and looked around. My husband had a fire burning and was thus thawing out his clothes so that he could put them on. I saw my little children covered with snow that had fallen during the night. Everything was dreary. Snow was sifting into my bed. I knew when I should get up with my little ones shivering around the campfire, I would have nothing to give them to eat but parched corn, and realizing that our supply of that was becoming short, my heart sank with me and I burst into weeping. What had we done to be thus treated by our fellow countrymen? My husband's father suffered untold hardships all through the Revolutionary War and had fought and bled to establish American freedom. So had my grandfather. They labored and suffered that all men might enjoy religious liberty in this land, and there we were, fleeing before a relentless and bloodthirsty mob composed of American citizens sent out by the governor to compel us to leave the state. All this because we believed that God was the same unchangeable being, that he had spoken from the heavens once more and restored the gospel as it was revealed by Jesus Christ when he was on earth through his chosen servant, Joseph Smith, the prophet. My husband heard me crying and with a tremor in his voice said, Cheer up, my dear. We will live and shine forth in the kingdom of our God when these murderous mobbers are in perdition. And more, I will have yet the privilege of preaching the gospel. This speech so comforted me that I arose with a light heart, and in the midst of snow, slush, and ice around our camps, parched our corn, ate it, and praised the Lord our God. End quote. As I said, this was by no means an isolated incident. Every camp dealt with what my grandparents dealt with. I mean, Patience Delilah Pierce Palmer's account that we just read through is representative of the entire Mormon experience. You know, during the winter of 1838 to 39, beginning in late November to early December, the Mormons were forcefully removed from Missouri and many of them had similar experience to that of the Palmers. The Mormons had been removed from Kirtland just the previous winter, forced to make the nearly 1,000-mile journey from Kirtland to Far West. 
It was nearing winter when Joe gave the first revelation that told people to leave New York and head for the Ohio. The Smith family moved during that same winter to Ohio of uh, 1830 to 31. You would think that the Saints would be used to moving around at the worst times of the year to possibly move by this point. But that's just what these Saints were experiencing in mass. You know, try to envision being Joe or any of the other Mormon leadership held up in Ray County or the Liberty Jail, not knowing what the Missouri militia was doing to the Mormons, only occasionally hearing rumors or getting little snapshots of the action from letter exchanges to and from loved ones. It must have been heart-wrenching to be the leaders of all of these people and know that they're being treated horribly by the Missourians. Now, the Mormons didn't really have anywhere reasonable to go. The majority of them who'd moved to Missouri had done so from New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, some parts of Canada, and even parts of Europe. They couldn't just say, oh, well, shit, we, we got to Missouri, they already had turned on the no vacancy sign, so we just turned around and came home. That wasn't an option for these people. They'd already sacrificed all their worldly possessions to get there. They didn't have anything to go back to. Even the saints who'd fled the persecution from the church in Kirtland, which had excommunicated Joe, Hinchpin Rigdon, Bloody Brigham Young, and so on, they couldn't just go the 900 miles back to Kirtland where the ruins of their old lives lay in disrepair. The only thing the saints living in Missouri could do was press ever forward. So they began to settle in this little town that bordered Missouri on the other side of the Mississippi called Quincy, Illinois. When I say a settle, that may be a bit of a strong word for what they were actually doing. The reality of the situation is a bit more complicated. The Missouri militia had agreed not to antagonize any Mormon who was actively fleeing the state. They didn't necessarily hold to it, but that was the agreement. But there were way more Mormons than there was habitable land on the shores of the west and east side of the Mississippi. So this caused two makeshift refugee camps to spring up. One on the Missouri side, with Mormon families waiting to cross the Mississippi on the ferry, and then one camp on the Quincy, Illinois side of the Mississippi, where the Mormons landed, awaiting further instructions from the leadership. Life wasn't great for these people. And there's no possible way to describe or even quantify the sacrifices that they made and the hardships they endured for something they sincerely believed was the God's honest truth. So now that we've kind of tracked what the Mormons that weren't incarcerated were doing, you know, we, we I've tried to paint this mental picture of what it was like for them because the removal from Missouri to Illinois was very harsh and it was a very unpleasant experience for the saints that were forced to endure it. So now that we kind of understand what they were going through, Let's cut back to our, what, what should we say, heroes? Yeah, our heroes inside Liberty Jail. But before we do cut back to Joe and Friends, there's a very interesting CES devotional given by um, Mr. St. Bernard Jowls, Jeff Holland himself, from September 2008 called a Lessons from Liberty Jail. Now, just indulge yourself by watching this. It's about 45 minutes. It's just him talking on a stand, you know, typical conference or CES type talk. And, you know, take a second to watch it and go over to the Missouri picture album on the Naked Mormonism Facebook page. And essentially, you'll be getting the tour of the Liberty Jail from an apostle and, you know, viewing pictures that I took all along the way. Now, let's get back to Joe and company. One thing that I neglected to mention for well, time restraints last episode was how proud the Missouri militia leaders were that they had broken up the Mormon resistance and successfully ended the conflict. It was nearly a week and a half journey from when the leaders were captured outside Far West and Diamond on November 1st until they actually reached Richmond, where the court of inquiry took place. Now, during that week and a half long journey, Generals Lucas, Clark, Wilson, uh, and, and some of the other commanding officers 
literally paraded the Mormon prisoners around the local townships that they were traveling through to show off their military success. And a similar theme occurs while the Mormons were incarcerated in Liberty Jail. So to describe that, first, I'm going to read a passage from Richard Van Wagner's uh, Sidney Rigdon, A Portrait of Religious Excess. It's an amazing biography on Sidney Rigdon. And this talks about their journey in early November prior to the Court of Inquiry. This is on page 264 to 65. Quote, General Wilson, according to Pratt's account, viewed his charges as wonderful royal prisoners. And en route, he often halted the whole brigade to introduce us to the populace, pointing us each out by name. Those are That's a quote. Rigdon's more peevish account likened it to a sideshow where, quote, this is quoting Rigdon, we served the same purpose that a caravan of wild animals would. Back to Van Wagner, probably the way side spectators were merely curious. Pratt, Parley P. Pratt, added that Wilson allowed no person to insult us or treat us with disrespect in the least. When they arrived in Independence, Rigdon and the others were initially quartered in a vacant house prepared for them. Although under guard, they were well treated. Quote, were it not for the absence of our families, Parley P. Pratt wrote, we should almost forget that we are prisoners. With an almost audible sigh of relief, he added, we believe that this journey saved our lives from the hands of furious men. Now back to Van Wagner. The prisoners were free to walk the streets of Independence without guard, visiting former haunts at will. The most sacred site in the vicinity was the place they had dedicated seven years earlier for the temple in Zion, their city of New Jerusalem. What had been a beautiful rise of ground heavily timbered in 1831 now lay desolate, a melancholy reminder of their shattered dreams, end quote. It's easy to agree with Pratt when he says that parading the Mormon leaders around probably saved their lives from the hands of furious men. Now, if it were circulated in the media and the common public knew that the Mormons were being moved by the Missouri militia through the counties for the purpose of facing them with the law in this court of inquiry, the Mormon-hating vigilantes wouldn't bother the Mormons or attempt an assassination because they were just, you know, the Mormons were getting what was coming to them. This was their just desserts. There were some benefits to parading the prisoners around so openly in the public. So the Mormons, and especially their leaders, were a spectacle to most people. You know, most citizens had spent so much time reading about and discussing with their friends and neighbors all about these damned religious fanatics known as the Mormons. Now those otherworldly and inhuman monstrous zealots were on exhibit for all to see. This social phenomenon remained true after the Court of Inquiry just as much as it did before, once the Mormon leaders were incarcerated in Liberty Jail, regular Missourians would come to look at the Mormons through the bars of the jail, you know, just to get a look at them, maybe mock them. You know, some of them might pass something through the bars to them, like a little corn cake or something. But um, here's how the uh, history.lds.org article discusses their zoo-like stay in Liberty Jail. Quote, Word spread of the Latter-day Saint prisoners at Liberty Jail, and the place took on some aspects of a zoo. Locals visited the jail in droves to gape at the prisoners, and their taunts and jeers echoed through the stone walls. Hiram Smith complained, quote, We are often inspected by fools who act as though we were elephants or dromedaries or sea hogs or some monstrous whale or sea serpents. Back to the article. Day after day, the men languished in jail, and the emotional sting slowly and continuously tested their faith. Now, quoting Joseph Smith, Our souls have been bowed down, and we have suffered much distress, and truly we have to wade through an ocean of trouble, Joseph wrote, end quote. The Mormons were in the public eye, and people wanted to see Joe and company. They wanted to go and see that these people were actually people and not demons, now, local Missourians weren't the only ones who visited the Mormons in jail. Uh, Porter Rockwell, as we know him, Pistol Pack and Port, uh, reportedly brought them alcohol-related refreshments, while Nancy Rigdon uh, came and visited her father and passed small cakes through the bars on the window to offer the prisoners some kind of respite from the disgusting food the jail guards were providing. Now, if we haven't gathered it by this time, the stay wasn't exactly a weekend resort at Liberty Jail. It was dark and cold, 
and the only bedding they had was hay, which mounted down the more they slept upon it. Now, it, they could have a fire to warm the place up a little bit, but the smoke couldn't escape, so it filled the room with eye-stinging suffocation every time they lit anything bigger than a candle. Sanitation and overall stench was a bit of a challenge, as the six men shared one chamber pot that may have been emptied at the end of the day, or it may not be emptied for a few days at a time. There's no way to know, really. The article on history.lds.org takes the level of detail a little bit further. Quote, The four-month confinement in Liberty Jail also took a heavy physical toll on the prisoners. Sunlight barely crept through two small iron-barred windows that were too high to see through, and long hours in the darkness caused the men's eyes to strain, as one of the jailers later remembered. While a small fire was allowed, without a chimney to channel the smoke, the prisoners' eyes became even more irritated. Their ears ached, their nerves trembled, and Hiram Smith even went in into shock at one point. Sidney Rigdon, the second oldest member of the company next to Baldwin, was in such poor health that, lying in an inclined bed, he petitioned for an early release. His eloquent speech and severe infirmity caused the judge to discharge Rigdon ahead of schedule, end quote. One small detail to add here, most of the prisoners were over six feet tall, thus forcing them to bend over any time that they were standing as the ceilings were only five foot eleven. I think it was Caleb Baldwin, it might have been McRae, who was the only guy under six feet tall. And that was the only person that could actually stand upright without creaking his neck or hunching over. Joe's spirits were, I mean, I mean there's no else to say it, at an all-time low. This may truly represent rock bottom for Joe. But the person I'm most concerned with when it comes to the Liberty Jail stay is Sidney Rigdon. Now, this could just be... Uh, due to my propensity to really like Sidney Rigdon, and that's maybe a failing and uh, a lacking on my part. I really enjoy reading and learning about Sidney Rigdon, and he's kind of my own personal hero, and I don't like to see bad stuff happen to him. So this is another passage from page 254 of Wagner's quintessential biography on Sidney Rigdon, A Portrait of Religious Excess. Quote, Hiram Smith later complained that because of my close and long confinement, as well as from the sufferings of my mind, I feel my body greatly broken down and debilitated. My frame has received a shock from which it will take a long time to recover. That was all quoting Hiram Smith. Back to Van Wagner, quote, 45-year-old Rigdon, a fretful hand wringer under stressful circumstances, was not a good companion. While the others bore taunts, bad food, unsanitary and crowded quarters, and the fear of lynching, Rigdon's frequent bouts of mania, followed by melancholic periods of whining, wore heavily on the others' nerves. The suffering of Jesus Christ, he was heard to mutter, were a fool to mine, end quote. Prior to this incident, and even prior to their indictment, Rigdon had a frail and tenuous connection to reality. It's hypothesized that his childhood horse riding accident wreaked untold havoc on his mental faculties, while another few incidents once he teamed up with Joe probably didn't really help his mental state. But for someone who teeters on the edge of sanity and broaches that line constantly in order to increase the emotion and impact of his sermons, this maddening stay in Liberty Jail was very taxing on the small remaining mental fortitude Rigdon had in reserve. Jail broke his brain. Jail, or the situation, or the food, coupled with dysentery, or constant worry for the well-being of his friends and family, or some combination of all these factors, caused Rigdon's mind to irreparably fracture. From this time forward, Rigdon would never be the same man. Luckily for him, as the earlier article from history.lds.org alluded to, his eloquence never departed. This is continuing on in Van Wagner's biography, where we left off on page 254. Quote, In January 25th, 1839, after petitioning to have their case heard on a plea of habeas corpus, the prisoners were brought before Judge Joel Turnham, a Clay County judge. The Smith brothers, along with McRae, White, and Baldwin, were represented by their previous counsel, Alexander Donovan. 
Rigdon, who considered himself a capable barrister, chose to present his own plea. His unique rhetorical skills served him well. When summoned to address the court, the still infirm spokesman spoke from a cot on which he reclined. After pleading innocent to the charges of high treason and murder, Rigdon began to relate the hardships and degradations he had suffered trying to serve God. He spoke of tar and feathers, homeless children, mobbings, hunger, cold, and of destitution. Donovan, who was unsuccessful in obtaining release for his clients later said of Rigdon's petition, "...such a burst of eloquence it was never my fortune to listen to." At its close, there was not a dry eye in the room. All were moved to tears. End quote. You know, you hear of those great speeches in history. You know, whether it's Lincoln's second inaugural address, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, Eisenhower's military industrial complex farewell speech, Churchill's blood, sweat, and tears, Frederick Douglass's Fourth of July, or you know, e even something before the modern era, like Demosthenes' speech to the Athenians, or Alexander the Great's oration to his men before invading India. You know, we have some of these modern speeches on video, which almost puts us in the audience. But given the millennia of great orators and the very short time we've had the ability to instantly record everything they're saying while they're saying it, you know, while these people are working their magic we can reasonably assume that most of the world's best speeches and orators have gone widely unnoticed, regardless of how great they may have been. If I could use a time machine for one single moment of history, this speech would be my destination. Now, to hell with going back to witness the JFK assassination or the shot heard around the world, the burning of the Library of Alexandria, or even witnessing Uzza or whatever his name is killed for touching the Ark of the Covenant when the, the oxen stumbled. If I had a voucher to use for one time in history, watching this speech delivered by Sidney Rigdon would be the only thing in the world that I want. And then, you know, I could just keel over and die a happy man after I drank some of the water back then or something. You know, it was later reported that a man stood up in the crowd after hearing the speech, claiming that he'd come there with his friends to inflict injury upon the men that day. But after hearing Rigdon's speech, he said, release these men, send them back to their destitute families. And rumor has it that the crowd even raised $100 in donations that day to give to Sidney Rigdon for his journey. That's our guy, Hingepin Sidney Rigdon. Everything turns on this guy. You know, it's like Rigdon had a secret weapon hidden in the back of his maddened skull that he just whipped out at the last conceivable minute. You know, I've read enough of Alexander Donovan's letters to know that he had his own way with manipulating and constructing words, but his words proved fruitless in petitioning the early release of five prisoners for whom he was advocating. Rigdon came in the room representing himself and dropped the goddamn nuke of oration, and everybody in the courtroom was left completely devastated by his magnificence, and the audience gave him a hundred dollars to help his return journey. Wow! You know, Rigdon's mind was arguably in a fragile state, which may have helped with the emotional punch of the delivered oration, but he wasn't completely maniacal. He still retained a very realistic understanding of the public perception of the Mormons and was thus terrified to leave the courtroom upon his instantaneous release. He knew that after he delivered that oration and stepped foot outside of the jail of Freeman, the mob would have their way with him, as they'd been wanting to do for months by that point. A public lynching was not out of the question. So, out of a sense of self-preservation, Rigdon consented to return to Liberty Jail as a free man among his five prisoner friends. He immediately organized an escape to make it look like the guards simply lost track of him instead of allowing him to escape. And from my understanding, 
It seems like Rigdon made quite good friends with the Chael guards, and he didn't want harm to befall them once their neighbors learned they allowed a Mormon leader to escape their jail. The elaborate escape was planned and executed. Phoebe Rigdon, who's Sidney's wife, and their son-in-law, George W. Robinson, arrived to help with the grand plan. And this next passage is from Van Wagner's biography on Rigdon, page 255. Quote, when darkness fell, the sheriff and jailer brought supper to their charges. After Sidney and Phoebe had eaten, Rigdon whispered to the jailer to blow out all the candles but one and step away from the door with that one. The sheriff then took him by the arm and a prearranged scuffle ensued. During the mock shoving match, the sheriff pushed Rigdon out the door onto the street, then shook his hand and bade him farewell, advising him to make his escape with all possible speed. After sprinting a short distance, Rigdon heard someone running behind him. Thinking his escape had been discovered, he drew his pistol, cocked it, and assumed a defensive posture, determining not to be taken alive. But as his pursuer drew near and spoke, Rigdon recognized it was George W. Robinson, his son-in-law. A few moments later, another ally, the guide, arrived with horses. In the rush of adrenaline and confusion of the moment, Rigdon had forgotten his wife in the jail. Robinson returned to get her while Rigdon and his squire left town as fast as their horses could manage. Three miles outside town, Robinson and Phoebe, riding in an open carriage, caught up with the horsemen. Phoebe and her son-in-law then drove to far west to gather the families, while Rigdon and his guide spared no horse flesh racing eastward across Missouri to an anticipated safe haven. Continuing on further down the page, when the travelers reached the western banks of the Mississippi after dark, Rigdon was so apprehensive about remaining in Missouri overnight that he paid two canoeists to transport him across the mighty river, where, wrote his son Wycliffe, he, quote, was free from his persecutors and could rest in peace, end quote. Rigdon was finally free and in Quincy, Illinois, across the Mississippi River. Upon his arrival... Rigdon realized just how useful Brigham Young had made himself. As one of the few presiding leaders of the church who hadn't been incarcerated, Bloody Brigham had been working tirelessly to organize the exodus of the saints from Missouri to Illinois, creating haphazard makeshift settlements for the nearly 10,000 saints who were arriving in droves. However, the Quorum of the Twelve, led by Brigham, didn't have the power to make executive decisions without consulting Joe Rigdon and Hiram. Well, Rigdon was back in town and ready to focus on the problems at hand and make some real decisions on behalf of the thousands of homeless saints. Keep the whole situation in perspective, though. Rigdon may have been free, but Joe and Hiram, the supreme leaders of the church, were still rotting away in Liberty Jail. The fact that Rigdon's powers of oration were enough to free him, but left the other leaders to toil in their cell, was something of an inconvenience to which Joe took, eh, let's just say, prejudicial notice. And I'd be pissed too. You know, imagine yourself in Joe's position. All said and done, Rigdon was one of the primary reasons that you're in jail in the first place, and now he gets out after a month and a half while you're still locked away for God knows how long? You know, Rigdon had given the July 4th oration the primary catalyst that led the public conflict between the Missourians and the Mormons, yet here you are with your closest friends, except for Rigdon, who unconvincingly escaped and now lived as a free man in Illinois, running the church. February was a hard month for Joe, Hiram, McRae, Baldwin, and White. Unbeknownst to them, Rigdon was amidst the process of negotiating and procuring Commerce City, Illinois, a barren swampland for the saints to settle. Rigdon acted in sole authority for this time, never asking Joe or Hiram for their guidance or thoughts. And we'll get into the details of those decisions on the next historical episodes. These monolithic decisions Rigdon made caused a few adverse effects. Firstly, both Rigdon and Joe realized that Rigdon could run shit without Joe and Hiram watching his back. And arguably, things went better when he did. 
What's more threatening to a leader's power than his second in command acting as a supreme leader for a certain amount of time? Secondly, Rigdon's well-being during this time should be taken into account. In Liberty Jail, he spent most of his time maniacally complaining or nearly despondent in a delicate and sometimes like manic mental state, a mental and physical state, really. I mean, Rigdon's daughter, Nancy, and his wife, Phoebe, were constantly worried about how Rigdon would pull through uh, during their various visits. They didn't know which Rigdon to expect each time they visited. It may have been the apocalyptic Rigdon rambling on about the doomed state of the world, or the Rigdon that would barely even acknowledge their presence in his depressed state. They may have even come to visit during some of his days of endless dysentery brought on by dirty water and terrible food, you know, wiping his chapped ass with the straw he'd been lying on for comfort the night before, never having a worthy bath during his entire imprisonment. It must have been tough for them to see their husband and father in this situation. Some historians have postulated that Rigdon suffered from severe manic depressive symptoms, sometimes even falling under swoonings or seizures in conjunction with or possibly due to the various brain injuries he'd suffered during his lifetime. Someone as ethereal and disconnected from reality as Rigdon is hard to put into a box inside our reality which properly describes such a personality. Similarly, It's hard to understand the complicated relationship Rigdon and Joe had throughout their years of trials and tribulations together, culminating in the strife rampant during the summer of 1838. This next passage I'm going to read is from Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History, and it describes the situation between Rigdon and Joe obviously leaving a fair amount of nuance absent due to the nature of historical studies. This is starting with page 251. Quote, To the dirty food, unsanitary and crowded quarters, and the fear of lynching, was added a new horror when someone smuggled poison into the tea and coffee. McRae, who drank neither beverage, escaped, but all who drank them, he said, were sorely afflicted, some being blind two or three days, and it was only by much faith and prayer that the effect was overcome. The prison discomforts were borne with fortitude by all the men except Rigdon. His frequent fits were followed by periods of whining that wore on the nerves of the younger men. When on February 25th, Donovan finally succeeded in getting him released on a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, Just a correction, I believe it was on January 25th. The others watched his departure with relief. Joseph, whose disillusionment with the older man was now complete, wrote in his journal with contempt, quote, He said that the sufferings of Jesus Christ were a fool to his, end quote. Glad as he was to be rid of him as a prison companion, the prophet was disquieted by thoughts of what Rigdon would do with the saints in Illinois, and took immediate steps to curb his authority. Beware of a, quote, fanciful and flowery and heated imagination, he wrote to his brethren, and ordered that the affairs of the church be transacted by a general conference rather than a single man. Fearful lest Rigdon try to revive the United Order and the Danites, he forbade the organization of large bodies upon common stock principles in property or of large companies of firms, and warned against the impropriety of the organization of bands or companies by covenants or oaths, by penalties or secrecies. End quote. Obviously, Brody takes certain historical liberties in coloring Joe and Rigdon's relationship as being more toxic than I personally picture it, but it's still understandable that Joe was a little bit apprehensive of Rigdon's power and influence without himself there to keep things in check. Now, there's no way of knowing for certain what tension underlie the Joe and Rigdon dynamic. One thing we can't lose sight of A significant number of the Mormons were Rigdonites long before they converted to Mormonism. Now, some of the core believers in Mormonism had been Rigdon's followers and close friends for years prior to Joe appearing on the scene. Rigdon was watching his friends and family chase from Missouri for the third mass exodus in Mormon history. But not only that, People who trusted him as their spiritual guide and conduit to God were now suffering from Rigdon's shitty management and poor choice in business partner. Everything that happened to the saints 
was due to decisions made by Joe, who was often influenced by Rigdon. In the early days of the church, Rigdon would influence Joe on doctrinal and theological issues. During the late Kirtland years and all the Missouri years, however, Joe was taking advice from and being influenced by a bunch of people concerning really tough situations. Any power Rigdon had over influencing Joe to do certain things in Missouri was heavily dampened by the sea of other advisors trying to make themselves useful to the prophet. Seeing this situation play out in front of us, I can't help but briefly muse on power dynamics. Okay, Take a journey with me as we contemplate and some might say ponderize on what power really is. Many people would consider Joseph Smith a powerful individual in religious history. Such claim runs perfectly in line with intuition. You know, how can somebody build a religious empire without being a powerful person? Well, let's qualify the term power. As a physical term, it implies ability to move something or accomplish some units of work. As a mechanical term, it's a measurement of a machine's ability to combat the forces of nature, like a car with 227 horsepower and 217 foot-pounds of torque, having the power to move itself, you know? Power can be equated with strength, especially when it comes to political or national power. And now my personal definition Power is the mechanism by which an object has the ability to move another inert object towards or away from potentiality. What gives a person that revered status of being a powerful individual? Typically, the term is accurately reserved for those who affect great social or political change on an inert system through unwavering and powerful tactics. You know, take Mahatma Gandhi. He was aggressively pacifist, but was considered a powerful man, able to affect political change, or at least bring the conversation of oppression to the forefront of the British Empire in India. Similarly, Carrie A. Nation was born a mere 20 years prior to Gandhi, and she was known as being a terrifyingly powerful six-foot-tall Kentucky hard-ass who advocated for temperance by literally attacking bars with hatchets. What about Lyndon Johnson, known as an abnormally powerful president? This is what his biographer named Randall Woods wrote of Lyndon Johnson. Quote, Depending on the circumstances, he could be Johnson the son of the tenant farmer, Johnson the great compromiser, Johnson the all-knowing, Johnson the humble, Johnson the warrior, Johnson the dove, Johnson the romantic, Johnson the hard-headed pragmatist, Johnson the preserver of traditions, Johnson the crusader for social justice, Johnson the magnanimous, Johnson the vindictive, or Johnson the uncouth, LBJ the hick, Lyndon the satyr, and Johnson the usurper, end quote. Only a truly powerful person could fit all those personalities and affect change depending on what hat they wear at a given time. Now, Johnson was well known for cornering his opponents and bombarding them with his perspective until they gave in to his will. He was a powerful individual. All of these people used their power in different ways to create change in a system typically plagued by inert actors. They recognized that something was the way that it shouldn't be, and they used their power and influence to move things in a certain direction. But power only works in true form when met by apathy. An apathetic actor can be very easily influenced by someone or something with power, which brings me to a question. Where did Joseph Smith fall on the powerful individual scale? Was he truly a powerful man? Or was he acted upon by powerful men as an apathetic and inert symbol of his office? For better or worse, powerful people are not easy to convince of anything. If they're dumb and powerful, they'll continue to bang their head against logic until the logic or their head breaks. If somebody is wise and powerful, well, we see those as some of the greatest people in history capable of constructing empires from nothing and overcoming incredible odds. The point is, we don't typically see powerful people who are quickly swayed by whatever tide or force they happen to encounter. 
I would make the argument that powerful people aren't often swayed by other powerful people. So let's consider Joe's timeline a little bit here. From the earliest days of his history, he was heavily influenced by his wishy-washy, intemperate universalist father, Joseph Smith Sr., and of course, universalist teachings find their way into the Book of Mormon. Joe was influenced by treasure diggers Lumen Walter, Samuel Lawrence, and Mason Chase, and many others, and these people obviously shaped some of Joe's understanding of reality, and treasure digging makes its way into the Book of Mormon as well. You fast forward to the Kirtland days, and the church was essentially run by the Quorum of the Twelve, Rigdon and Hiram, supposedly under Joe's rule, but we don't see many theological debates or arguments over policy stemming from Joe himself. Most arguments are between outside actors or uninformed saints with Rigdon or Cowdery arguing on behalf of Joe and the church. Some of the greatest sermons in the church were never delivered by Joe, but by Rigdon. When it came to military actions in Missouri, Joe trusted George Hinkle, Samson Avard, and Captain Fearnon and many others to run the Mormon military, which ended with some horribly botched skirmishes and the surrender and removal of all Mormons living in Missouri. Beyond Missouri, Joe meets a number of powerful men which influence his politics, religion, and even his very morality. John Bennett lived with Joe for barely a year and nearly brought down the church with his spiritual wifery and the following expose he published once he defected. James Strang was considered a very close friend of the prophet with rightful revelatory claim to the throne after his death. Nearly half of the saints followed him instead of bloody Brigham out to Utah. The only way Joe was able to convince some women to marry him was because he told them about this big scary angel friend who appeared to him in the middle of the night with a giant flaming cock a giant flaming sword in the middle of the night commanding them to get married or be destroyed he couldn't even come up with a powerful and cogent argument to get these women in the honeymoon pose he had to scare them into polygyny by invoking his big mean friend from out of town Back to the point of this entire historical timeline episode, when Joe needed it the very most in his life, he couldn't summon up enough emotive power to be released from the hellhole prison he was stuck in. His friend Donovan, a lawyer and brigadier general of the Missouri State Militia, couldn't even use his power and influence to get the prophet released. Joe and his four friends would remain inert in prison until March, but... Give the standover to Rigdon for 10 minutes, and everybody in the courtroom is inconsolable and throwing money at him, begging the judge for his release. The ability of one man to convince a room of people to do whatever he pleases is a weapon that changes the entire field of play. Rigdon could force his will upon an inert population and cause them to move into a state of potentiality. What happened after was contingent upon the direction Rigdon steered the energy of that room. Whether it was convincing his followers to be baptized by the new Mormon preachers from New York, convincing Joe to march with 200 men to their certain death in Missouri in 1834, convincing the thousands of Mormons to move from their safe havens in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Canada, Britain, or wherever for a quote-unquote better life in a temporary city of refuge in Missouri, or even convincing thousands of people that they should vote for Joe and Rigdon as president and vice president of America in 1844, Rigdon was the mechanism by which so much work was done and so much potential energy was realized and implemented. Rigdon is a force waiting to awaken at a moment's notice. Rigdon is true power. And that's it for the historical portion of this week's episode. Now, normally, well, I, I shouldn't say normally, but for the past few episodes, this is usually when I uh, jump into the Mormon Mimsy segment. You know, I've, I've had a bit of time to think while I've been out on this month long, uh, month plus long tour. And, uh, you know, lots of time just staring at empty roads and, and contemplating things. This show, of course, 
has been emulating other successful shows. You go back to some of the earliest Naked Mormonism podcast episodes, you'll hear a very strong copying of Dan Carlin and other, you know, like historically driven, monologue driven type of podcasts. You know, and as it progresses, I've been incorporating things that other shows have been doing that are successful. You know, that's, that's how you build a successful system is you take existing systems that are successful and you implement and take little snippets here and there from them. Well, the Mormon Mimsy, it was what I was trying to do, uh, to get people engaged and, um, active on, on Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. Now, while it did have, uh, some mixed success, of course, it made me realize that, you know, that's not really the nature of this show. You know, people come to this show to sit back, to learn Mormon history, or to learn, you know, like on the special edition episodes, contemporary things that are going on in the church, or whatever the case may be, you come here to be entertained, not necessarily to do any scholarship for yourself, or not, like, not to go read some of these books, or to Google in a passage that I read to you and say, where did this come from? That's not what this show is for. It's for sitting back, being entertained, and learning something along the way. So, I think it's uh, it's important for me to to keep that in sight and not try and implement little features and facets of the show that are not necessarily in the kind of the, the vein of the show or, you know, don't necessarily play into the general tone. And I think Mormon Mimsy, as fun as it was for the few weeks that we did it, I think I'm going to retire that segment and just say that it, it, it's not necessarily what uh, people that listen to this show are looking for. That being said, um... While I was out and about, I gathered a ton of material for special edition episodes. There's way too much to talk about. So for the next many special edition episodes, we're going to be going through a few things that might take a bit of time to get through. There's one, I'll just say right now, there's one thing that I'm working on. And I know once it does come to fruition, once I do uh, release an episode on it, I'm going to have to release probably two or three subsequent episodes the next two or three weeks on that same topic. Uh, so we, we might be breaking with the, the punctuated historical episode special, historical special, you know, alternating weeks just for some of these brief segments because there are some topics that are just going to be way too huge for me to cover in one week. And I don't want to try and split it up over, you know, three weeks when I can just do it over two weeks. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. But uh, what I'm trying to say is we have a lot to talk about. I learned a lot on the Mormon history tour, which I'm going to try and talk about briefly here in a minute. Um, and I, I'm I'm really stoked to share it with all of you guys. Uh, but we might not be sticking with our strictly historical episode alternating with the special edition episodes. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. But the historical timeline, of course, will always be and always is the focus of this podcast. And we're going to stick with that as we slowly work into the Nauvoo years. Oh, God, (laughs) it's a little intimidating. Of course, one thing I do need to get to, I've been waiting for a bit of time to do this. We have a lot of patrons to thank. Oh, my. Um. We did have some Patreon pledge edits, uh, as well as a number of new patrons that signed up to support at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. So I'm going to read these off. We have new patrons, um, Akmenotep, uh, Jerem, Betty, Jeff, Scott, Clint, Emily, Dusty, Lynn, uh, Elizabeth, Cass, Pulpit Podcast, Lane, Hal, Jeff and Maggie, Devil Doc, Eric, Zena, Jim, George, and Tinkerbell. Now, some of those were pledge edits, but a number of them were brand new patrons. And to all of those patrons, especially the new ones, I want to thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart for pledging to support this work. Really, you are the backbone that keeps this running. And more than anything, you make it possible for me to go out to places like these Mormon sites where I recently visited and see them firsthand and bring some uh, firsthand scholarship to the table here. So to all of those who do support, you are funding investigative journalism, historical reporting, and historical research. And that's what's important here, and I really want to thank you for doing so. Okay, um, another point of housekeeping to take care of, uh, the 
the Nemo home evenings, we we did those during the time that I was out and about, and we've now had uh, two Nemo home evenings that I didn't really broadcast or announce, but they're just the first Monday of every month, the first Monday night, beginning at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's when we host our Nemo home evenings, and it's just a Google Hangout, um, and patrons can join in. And we just sit down and talk with somebody else, another podcaster or um, somebody who is uh, doing some interesting work who may not necessarily be related to Mormonism specifically. And of course, if you are a patron supporter, you do get a link sent to your email the night of and you can join into the Google Hangouts and ask questions and and field questions and and, uh, have discussions with these special guests. Now, of course, I don't know why I haven't been doing this, but this kind of provides a certain outlet that I really haven't had before. You know, so much of, uh, well, I shouldn't say so much, but everything about this podcast that we do is related to Mormonism, but not everything that runs through my mind is Mormonism. You know, there's a lot of people that I talk to that don't necessarily have any applicable knowledge in Mormonism specifically, but they're interesting people to talk to, and I want to conduct an interview or have a discussion with them on air. So, in that respect, Nemo Home Evenings are going to be that outlet for non-Mormon discussions with interesting people. And beginning with um, with uh, June 2017, we're going to start just broadcasting those over the podcast feed after they're done, after we're done recording them. People will be able to join in as patrons. You'll be able to join in and ask questions, as I said earlier, but we'll be... Uh, We'll be sending those th- that those recordings out into the podcast feed for everybody to consume. It's not necessarily Mormon related, but uh, these are very interesting people that I enjoy talking to. So um, that that's kind of the the future of the name of home evenings. We're going to try and uh, use that as an outlet for discussions with really cool people. Now, all right, on to the main thing I really wanted to talk about here: the history tour and Reason Con. Okay, so. The Naked Mormon History Tour, um, I, I did release these little snippet travel logs. They were anywhere from like five minutes to 45 minutes, you know, just my musings on what I had done that day or over the past few days or whatever the case was. Not everybody has listened to those travel logs, nor will everybody listen to them. So I'm just going to kind of do... A little bit of a wrap up of the Mormon history tour. This segment's going to go a little bit long, longer than I want it to, but it's important to kind of relate what I experienced and tell everybody about it and maybe raise awareness for some of these historical sites that might exist somewhere near you. You know, go check them out for yourself. So I departed March 17th, 2017, took off from Seattle, hopped in the car and drove down to St. George and began the Mormon history tour there. And from there, I left St. George. My very first Mormon historical hotspot that I stopped was Martin's Cove in Wyoming. The Martin's Cove is where the Martin Handcart Company stayed for five days when they were snowed in in uh, early to mid-October when a massive blizzard hit them. Now, Martin Willie Handcart Company, of course, were the highest uh, casualty number uh, handcart company that made their way across the plains for various reasons. But Martin's Cove was where they stayed for five days. It was a really fascinating spot. And, you know, it's it's hallowed ground for Mormons. After that, I cut across over to um, Nauvoo. And I spent one day in Nauvoo. That was a huge mistake. Nauvoo is an amusement park, basically, of Mormon history museums. And they have a bunch of original buildings that have all been restored and they're living museum pieces. They have missionaries there working, you know, dressed up in garb and doing fun stuff there. And there's enough that you could spend three or four days in Nauvoo and see something different on all of those days, never repeating one of your stops. As well as the Nauvoo Temple that was uh, reconstructed back in 20, 2002, I think. Nauvoo Temple is beautiful. My God, that's a beautiful building. So Nauvoo was the first stop. After that, I dropped straight south to Missouri because that was, oh, I, sorry, I also hit Carthage, which is just, you know, like 15, 20 miles from Nauvoo. Um, but Carthage is where Hiram and Joseph were shot. 
Uh, John Taylor was shot but not killed, and Willard Richards survived unscathed. Uh, Oh, sorry, he had uh, one ball just graze his earlobe. Um, So Carthage was a really cool experience, kind of a gratifying uh, sense. It's like where this is where Joseph ended. This is where a legacy died and a new legacy was born. It's really interesting place to go visit. Uh, and of course I couldn't help but ans- ask some hard questions of the missionary there. And he answered them honestly. I was, I was happy and surprised to see that. After that, I dropped down to Missouri and independence, but there's so much in Missouri from, uh, for people who have been listening back for the past, you know, five, 10 historical episodes. There's so much that happens in Missouri. It's not just independence where the saints initially settled in 1831. It's like independence and liberty and far west and, uh, uh, and, uh, Adam on Diamond and, um, it, uh, it, like all of these places around the area, around independence within, yeah, uh, reasonably 60 miles of independence. It was amazing. No, Missouri is the home to so many breakoff factions of the church. It's the home to the community of Christ's Temple, which I went there and attended one of their prayer sessions. It's the home to the Hedrickite, the Temple Lot Mormons, as they are known. Uh, they claim to be the original church established in 1830. They just go by Church of Christ, which that was the name that church, uh, Joseph established in Fayette, New York in 1830. The, I mean, there's the, I guess not the Strangite headquarters, but there are a number of Strangite families living in Missouri. I mean, the place is just filled to the brim with really cool Mormon history and cool stuff to see. And that was one of the cooler visitor centers uh, for the LDS church that I saw. They really decked that place out <laughs> quite well. And being that I was the only guy, I got to go on the tour with uh, with two lovely young sister missionaries who took me through their their tour. And then... This may, I, I was telling my friend Joel about this, Joel Kuhn, who does the D&C Compare website that we use for My Book of Mormon podcast. I was telling him about my experience at the Missouri uh, Visitor Center, and I told him that after I was done with, or, you know, after the sisters took me on the tour, they brought me upstairs and sat me down in front of the Space Jesus in that Visitor Center, and two more sister missionaries uh, joined them for an a cappella version of I Know That My Redeemer Lives. And they just sang uh, the whole song to me right there, a cappella, and it was just me sitting there with, you know, Space Jesus in the background, obviously a very emotive experience. And Joel was like, that's really fucking weird, man. <laughs> I would have felt so awkward. I'm like, well, I mean, that was just like normal to me. That just seems like just a totally normal thing for Mormon missionaries to do. And it was, but it's like from an outsider's perspective, no, he's right. It is really weird. So that was uh, the Missouri Visitor Center was a was really a cool experience. After that, I made my way to Kirtland. I spent four days in Kirtland, and I'm so glad that I did. Honestly, Kirtland was probably the highlight of the entire experience for me. And that's only because I've been studying Kirtland so heavily for the past two plus years. I mean, it's been the focus of my studies for so much time now. And, you know, Kirtland is so important to Mormon history. If I had studied Nauvoo as much as I've studied Kirtland, Nauvoo might have been the highlight this ter- this this journey. But Kirtland was definitely it. They The church owns what is downtown historic Kirtland where they have the Newell K. Whitney store, the Whitney home, the Johnson Inn, uh, the Ashery, the Sawmill, uh, a number of other buildings, uh, Cindy Rigdon's Tannery. They just have a number of buildings there in the historic downtown. And uh, wow, just wow. I, I went through a tour with a few people that um, obviously knew the history quite well, and it was exciting to to have those conversations with those people spend some time talking deep Mormon history with some of these missionaries who have done more than just read through the pamphlet that the church hands to the missionaries when they get there, who have actually been reading books on uh, on Mormon history. It's surprising how much many missionaries know about the history. And, and I reserve that primarily for the elder missionaries, not elder as in male, but the elder as in like the, the older couple missionaries. Because they're retired couples, you know, they, most of them have been in the church their entire lives. So they go and serve missions at these historic sites working for the church. And in their free time, they just read Mormon books. Oftentimes, they just spend all of their life ingratiated in Mormonism, you know, like I do, only they believe in it to boot. 
So those people are fun to have conversations with. And now, granted, their minds don't seem to be as malleable and influent, um, easily influenced as some of the, the younger missionaries, but they're still capable of understanding a nuanced discussion and capable of understanding when is a good time to engage into a deep Mormon history discussion with somebody who they just met, like myself. Out of all of the missionary groups that I, um, I, I toured with or that, that offered the tour, I really appreciated going with older couples. They were way more fun to take the tours from than, you know, the, the young elder, or young sister missionaries. So Kirtland was super cool. I got a chance to speak with, uh, somebody who is known as Mr. Kirtland, Carl Anderson. He's written, uh, two books on just Kirtland history. Um, he was nice enough to invite me into his home for an hour. And then an hour and 45 minutes later, we were still talking and just enjoying each other's conversation so much. So, uh, that was a really, really good discussion. I threw some ideas at him that he was resilient to. Um, of course, I'm just reiterating a little bit of these experiences. Go to the travel logs to listen for a lot more detail in this. And then I also met with the, uh, the community of Christ people who own, the Kirtland Temple. The Kirtland Temple is still in the possession of the Community of Christ, and I took the Basement to Belfry tour, which is the entire tour of the entire temple. You go walk underneath and look at the floor joists, you look at everything, and you go all the way up to the Belfry, standing up in the bell tower where there are engravings of um, initials of people who worked on the temple at the time. I mean, it's really, really incredible. So uh, Kirtland was truly the highlight of the whole tour. After that, I made my way to um, what used to be Harmony, Pennsylvania, and I didn't find this out until after it was too late, but Harmony, Pennsylvania today isn't the same Harmony as existed in the 1830s. I can't remember the name of the town now, but they're separated by like 200 something miles. <laughs> so I showed up at Harmony, Pennsylvania, and I'm like, what? where's like, where's the where's the hail home? Where? Where, where's the hail farm? Where, where do I go? And there were no signs, no anything. So I did a little bit of Google searching. I was like, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm still like four and a half hours away from, from the real harmony. Crap. <laughs> so, um, I did eventually make it to the hail farm, the hail residence there. And that was really cool. That was where Joseph lived and translated like 70% of the Book of Mormon was on the hail farm with Oliver Cowdery. Really incredible stuff happened there. Uh, and the church only recently reacquired the land and rebuilt the, the homes there based on descriptions, journal entries, and pictures of the time. Cool stuff. And then after that, I made my way to Boston to meet with somebody. I've never been to Boston before. I wanted to see it. And also, I had to meet with a professor there at the Boston University campus. And uh, yeah, I spent a couple days in Boston just kind of tooling around. That was really cool. And then after that, I made it to Palmyra on April 6th, 1830. And the evening that I arrived there, I met with a man named Bill Caffin, who owns one of the hills that uh, Joseph Smith was digging treasure on. This is known as the Old Sharp Hill, where Dan Vogel asserts that Joseph sacrificed a lamb in order to uh, to satiate the hunger of the treasure guardian spirits and allow them to give up their treasure unsuccessfully of course but there's still a hole that exists there just this massive crater in the hillside that it, it, there's no reason for it to exist other than it being dug out and washed out through you know over a century of time really cool i stood in what people consider or people hypothesize is one of joseph smith's treasure digging holes now that, that was a gratifying experience and i did that on april 6th uh, 2017, the anniversary of the foundation of the church. After that, I spent, uh, I think it was three days total in New York. I spent a bunch of time. Uh, I spent one of the days up in Ontario County going through, uh, you know, trying to track some things down and hopefully information will be coming out, uh, very soon about what I was able to track down there. And then I spent a bit of time in actual Palmyra, and Fayette, I went and toured uh, the Moroni Visitor, uh, the Hill Cumorah Visitor Center and went and walked up on top of the Hill Cumorah. And it was snowing up there, but it was really cool because the Angel Moroni Monument on Hill Cumorah 
had on a snow apron. It looked like a temple apron made of snow. I'm not shitting you. Go to the Facebook page, the Naked Mormonism Facebook page, and look at the New York photo album. There are pictures posted of a gold Moroni with a white apron on. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, New York was really cool. I enjoyed that quite a bit. And then after that, it was headed home and the place, the primary place I stopped on my way back all the way across the plain States was uh winter quarters, Nebraska. It's just North of Omaha. Uh, I think it's considered actually North Omaha. Now they have a temple there and a visitor center of like the pioneer sites where, and that's where my grandpa spent four years. I believe it was building hand carts, uh, from 40, like late 47 to early 52. That's where my grandpa and grandma were. Um, one of my, my direct grand, great, great grandfather was born in winter quarters, William Moroni Palmer. And yeah, winter quarters was really cool. It's right next to a cemetery where, um, over a hundred saints are buried, um, just just in that cemetery from the, uh, the 1850s when they were living there. And, you know, all of Nebraska uh, and Iowa, right along the border there, uh, there are, uh, there are over a hundred settlements that were, you know, may have been just a couple of families in a log cabin or may have been as big as like winter quarters was. It was 4,000 people at the time the Mormons were living there. You know, it was widely populated with a bunch of Mormons, Camped out there preparing for their trip across the plains to get to Utah. Really cool stuff. After that, I made it to Utah. There's way too much to talk about with Utah. But I will say I went and saw a bunch of historic sites. I met with a ton of people. I stayed with Joey um, of the Pulpit Podcast he, and his family in Springfield. That was really nice and accommodating of them. I spent time hanging out with Joey and Andrew as well as my friend Julianne, uh, who's known as the real Emma Hale on Twitter. You know, I, it, I, God, I don't even know what to say about Utah. Utah was just an amazing way to cap off the entire trip, including visiting Mountain Meadows Massacre. I'll tell you guys right now. I did make appearances on two video interviews. One of them was on Marvelous Work and a Wonder, which is Christopher Namelka, uh, the guy who translated the sealed portion of the plates. Uh, There's there will be a link for the Facebook broadcast of that video in the show notes of this episode. It's two and a half hours. It's very frustrating. If you can get through the whole thing, I say uh, more power to you. I don't know if I would recommend watching it. It was very hard to get through when I was having the conversation with him. And I think it's even harder to get through actually watching it and seeing the comments roll in because it's kind of an even split between people who were, you know, followers of him and people who were followers of reason combating each other on the comment thread on Facebook page. So, um, yeah, give that a watch if you want to. Like I said, it's two and a half hours, marvelous work and a wonder. This guy, Christopher Namelka, is a a fascinating individual, to say the least. And then another show that I made an appearance on was Heart of the Matter, which Heart of the Matter was the first thing in the world that got me interested in Mormon history. It's done by a guy named Sean McCraney, a Christian pastor who has been on the air for like 12 years now or something. Uh, Yeah, I think they started in 06, so 11 years. And they just did a systematic deconstruction of Mormon history, and that got me interested in the history. And then I was able to just parse it out from the Jesus crap that he talks about. So Sean invited me on to his show on the heart of the matter, and we talked Mormonism for, well, not just Mormonism, but Mormonism and atheism and the the burgeoning society of millennials that are coming out of the church and whatnot. We talked that for an hour. It's much easier to watch than, than the Christopher Namelka interview. Um, so I would give that one a recommend. It's also in the show notes for this episode. You can watch the YouTube video of it. Uh, and also I did record an interview with Sean, uh, just for this podcast and it will be rebroadcasted at some point, uh, or not rebroadcast, but it will be broadcasted on the podcast feed at some point. Uh, as I said earlier, I gathered so much material while I was out there. There's just too much to talk about now. And, uh, I have, the next few special edition episodes planned out for this, this whole thing. It's, I got a lot of audio while I was out there, a lot of good material. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's just about it. I, there's so much to talk about 
with this Mormon history tour. You know, you spend a month plus a few days driving across the country and back and then try and summarize what you experienced in the last month in just an hour of talking into a microphone. It can't be done. It simply can't be done, you know, and that's why I recorded the travel logs as we went along just just so people could, you know, be caught up with where I was attending, where I was going and, um, you know, kind of get a sense for what I experienced that day or that two or three days because um, there's just there's way too much bouncing around in my mind to try and recount it now. Of course, I do have a huge plethora of thanks to give to people because it was only through the generosity of listeners that I was able to make this happen through people who said, Hey, I got a guest room. Hey, I got a couch. You can crash, whatever. I had to pay for very little sleeping accommodations for this whole trip. And that made this, this entire thing a possibility. Um, there are a number of people that I, I stayed with and I want to thank them all personally. Um, thanks to Travis, Nick, uh, Marie, Joel, Dario, Jim and Loris, Aaron, Ryan, Leia, Fernanda, Bill, Jonathan, Andrea, um, AC, who prefers to remain anonymous. So I'll just give the initials, uh, Mayo, Andrew and Joey, Preston and Melissa, Julie, Sean, McCraney, uh, Harry and Robbie, and I'll even say thanks to Chris. Um, to, to all of those people and to so many more people that I can't even begin to mention, you all made this trip a possibility. And in your own ways, you enriched the experience. You brought it all to life. You know, I, I there's no way that I can say thanks more than just saying thank you. Because, you know, it seems lacking. Thanks. Saying thanks is just lacking so much. I, I wish I could do more to give it punch and say that this truly meant so much to me. That everybody was so hospitable and accommodating and willing to meet with me and willing to come and hang out and, and excited to be going to these Mormon history places, especially in Utah. And, you know, to everybody that made this everything that it was you all truly hold a deep place in my heart and i i wish that i could express my appreciation to you more than just broadcasting it all over the airwaves but this was truly a special experience and i have all of you to appreciate for that and it pains me to say this but most of all i need to thank the lds church and its staff of you know, essentially slave labor missionaries for providing these living museums available to tour year round. You know, without these museums, without these tour places, you know, none of them would have been fun to go see. None of them would have been fun, been fun to visit. So I do want to say, and I said this at many of the church sites, I'm glad the church does what it does with these historic sites and puts so much money into building up and maintaining them and creating these living museum places. It was, uh, it's really special in its own way. And I am sincerely saying this. Thank you to the church for doing what you do. And uh, on a final note, while I was out there, you know, I told you guys that I was taking this 360 video camera with me. Well, I shot a metric shit ton of 360 video, but it takes forever to process and edit and put together. Now, those are going to be released slowly and periodically on the Naked Mormonism YouTube channel. But if anybody has experience with editing 360 videos that they could share or they want to gain some experience, consider reaching out to me at nakedmormonism at gmail.com and we'll talk. But I mean, there's a ton of 360 video that I have saved up on my hard drive here, just in the can waiting to be broadcasted. You know, um, there's currently one video that I shot and produced. It's on the, the naked Mormonism YouTube channel, and it features yours truly at the Jacob Hamlin farm in St. George, Utah. And I just talk a little bit about the history there and tell some of the stories of who Jacob Hamlin was. And that's just kind of a brief taste and an early version of what the rest of these 360 videos will be like. Most of them are like five to 15 minutes long. 
And one of them is almost an hour long because there's just too much to see at the Gilgal Gardens in Salt Lake City. So, yeah, be looking out for those. I'll announce them as they are released at the end of the shows when I am. I'll be releasing them more than likely just chronologically from when I shot them, walking backwards through the history of the church and then walking you know, forwards again all the way into Utah. So that will uh, that, that kind of gives a little bit of a, a structure and framework for when you can expect to see those 360 degree videos available. And there's, well, <laughs> there's some fascinating information there. And you don't even have to stare at my mug while I'm telling you the information. You can look around and see the scenery around or just stare at the sky if you want to. So, oh, wow. Um, I'm just scrolling through my notes. Do I have anything else? Oh, my God. How did I forget this? Reason Con. Reason Con. I just landed on, on Sunday for Reason Con. What to say about Reason Con? Okay. Reason Con. This was the third iteration of this convention in Hickory, North Carolina. The first one was done back in, I think, 2013. Uh, the second one, 2015, and now 2017 is the third iteration. It's seen as kind of like the frat party of atheist skeptical podcasting conferences, and it's it fits the bill for whatever you're looking for in a convention. You know, I attended with Joel and Marie, uh, Joel, who does uh, the the comparison site for the Doctrine and Covenants that Marie and I use for my Book of Mormon podcast, and also Marie, my co-host. You know, we spent quite a bit of time in uh, North Carolina hanging out, enjoying Reason Con, and also I was able to meet some people that I've never met before and hang out with some of my good friends whom I haven't seen for two years. Reason Con was it. It was the absolute bomb. If you're ever considering going to a, a conference like this, it's a certain sense of community and engagement that you don't get anywhere else. And for people that are, you know, for a lot of people that come out of the church, there isn't a landing pad. There isn't a social structure where you can land that is... Well, that replaces the church. That's never going to happen. There will never be that social structure that is the perfect alternative to the church. But these conventions are the beginning of that. These conventions are the groundwork that that infrastructure can possibly be built upon. And Reason Con was, you know, it. It was the first conference I ever went to back in 2015 when I first started this podcast. It was, uh, you know, it, it was one of the first times where I've ever felt like I was part of a community outside of the church where I belong. And I can talk to people on a real level and just engage and have fun, you know, and seeing many of my friends who I'd seen before or hadn't seen in two years or had only seen periodically at other times throughout the two years since we were at Reason Con 2 together, it was a special experience and it was you know, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. And that's maybe that's the point I'm getting at is it, it instills this feeling and this excitement that's beyond words that can't actually be described. And I'll just leave it at that and say, go to a conference, go to a conference sometime, make 2017 the first year that you go to a conference or Make 2017 a year where you went to a number of conferences just like you did the previous years. You know, these are fun and they're advocating for something good. You know, people kind of wrestled with the idea of, well, we're having this in North Carolina, the home of House Bill 2, the transgender bathroom bill, you know, home of racism and bigotry and um, homophobia and just xenophobia and all of these these backwards hick ideals why are we putting money into the local economy in North Carolina? You know, why would we choose to have this conference there? You know, I have a completely different approach to it. Why wouldn't we have this conference there? You know, I'm in Seattle. I'm in a safe haven of liberalism and progressive ideals. You know, people, many people that listen to this live in, you know, big cities like this that are, you know, overwhelmingly liberal 
um, whether that that's domestically or foreign, you know, oftentimes people with these uh, progressive ideals tend to centralize into these small geographic locations, which leaves large swaths of the voting republic that are, well, not privy to progressive ideals. And that's what North Carolina is. You know, Charlotte is kind of a progressive little town, uh, but everything outside of Charlotte, which Hickory is, there's, it's all Hick town. You know, it's, it's the banjos are playing out there. Okay. You know, some of the houses that we were driving past, it's like that house was clearly a plantation. I mean, it's clear to see like the history is very, uh, well, there's still many parts in North Carolina that are still living in the 19th century. So that being said, maybe it's important to bring liberalism and progressivism to these places that need it the most. You know, maybe create an influx of money and and influence and people that are different minded from the people that are already living there into these areas that need it. You know, it's it's the epidemiology of ideals. Spread good ideas through implanting them in different places where those good ideas don't exist and let them propagate by themselves. You know, my opinion is like, why would we want to boycott Hickory? Why wouldn't we want to go and hold a yearly conference there as a safe haven for the people that live there that share our same ideals? Let's get some colleges built there. Let's turn Hickory into a progressive safe haven for people that don't have anywhere to turn that live in that area. You know, bring in those ideas, bring in people that are more open minded and we might just see the demographic shift. Now, granted, my idea isn't like a, you know, a, a few month long plan of like, oh, House Bill 2 sucks. Well, fuck you, North Carolina. And therefore, we're not going to spend any money in your town, your your state or whatever. Mine is like a 20, 30, 40 year type of plan. Let's try and turn Hickory, this little podunk banjo playing town, into what we want it to be. And it doesn't go for just Hickory. It goes for any place that is overwhelmingly conservative and, um, you know, resistant to a progression. That's how you do it effectively. You get more people there who share progressive ideas and those ideas infect the people around them. That's just kind of my, my screed on this. That's my opinion. I think that boycotting is one way to get things done in a very slow manner and boycotting North Carolina for House Bill 2, you know, might have been effective at like a corporate level. But like just saying that we're not going to spend our money there just because they did something wrong. I think that's kind of the wrong way to approach this. Maybe we should, uh, create an influx of ideas and money into areas that need it the most from people who need to spread their ideas there the most. That's just my thoughts. Reason Con was amazing. And there are way too many people to say, you know, it was great to see you there. It was great to meet you. It was great to hang out with you again. Way too many names. I'm not even going to attempt trying to say them. But to all of those people that I did meet, did speak with, whether it was briefly or extended conversations, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I want to personally thank you for taking that time to to talk with me. <sighs> wow. Um, that is, wow, this episode went way longer than I thought. Holy shit. Okay. Let's button it up. Let's call it good. This has been our triumphant return from our hiatus. On Star Wars Day, May the 4th, be with you all. But before calling it a night, of course, I need to thank a few people. I'll start off by thanking Demonista for running the Facebook page, as well as to the real Emma Hale for running the Twitter handle. Thank you both for doing that very much. I need to thank Jason Camo for providing the music in this show used with his permission. Be sure to go to alaststateofmind.com to hear more of his music there and download it. Thank you to Craig Keeling for providing the artwork used in this show with his permission. Go to weirdmormonshit.com to see his blog. Thank you very much to Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast for providing the legal services for this show and for all of the messes that I like to get myself into. I deeply appreciate it, my friend. 
I need to thank the patrons who support the show through patreon.com slash naked mormonism. Be sure to sign up there to get exclusive Patreon only content, extended episodes, as well as gain access to our NAMO home evenings on Google Hangouts. Of course, most of all, I need to thank all of the listeners out there once again for lending me your ear and for coming back. Thank you all so much for joining me for the two and a half years almost this has been running and for joining me once again on this show. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, all rights reserved.